Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to the stream. Today we're going to be going through this book, which is Practical Common Lisp by... Uh, I seriously considered looking up the name. Uh, the site is gigamonkeys.com slash book if you want to follow along. Link is in the description. And... Uh, yeah. I made this little org document so we can kind of follow along and write stuff down as we go through it. Uh, so that'll be nice. Uh, so we're going to start with the introduction. Why Lisp? Do you think... So, so here's the thing with this stream, okay, is I'm bad at streaming, so uh, if it seems like uh, something is janky here, like if you can't read these words, um, that's, that's, uh, I, I know. Anyway, I think the greatest pleasure in programming comes from getting a lot done with code, simply and clearly expresses your intentions. Programming in Common Lisp is also like in be about the most fun you can have with a computer. Boom. Very bold claim indeed. Um, now, I'm into Emacs. I've been using Emacs for about a year, and it is the coolest thing ever, in my humble opinion. So, uh, I've heard very good things about Common Lisp. Uh, this introduction is kind of the backstory of how the author got into Common Lisp and uh, and programming and stuff. Here's the question though, why Lisp? It's hard in only a few pages of an introductory chapter to explain why users of a language like it, and it's even harder to make the case for why you should invest your time in learning a certain language. Personal history only gets us so far. That is true. Uh, so there's different languages have different payoffs and you kind of want you kind of want to reason sometimes, um, and we don't really need a reason here. I'm trying to just breeze through this because there's not much code to go through in all honesty. Um, so uh, Lisp is generally, uh, it's It's just uh, super, there's tons of articles about why Lisp is the best language, and I'm not good at saying what saying the point of them all, but it's in there somewhere. Where it began, Common Lisp is the modern descendant of the Lisp language first conceived by John McCarthy in 1956. It was designed for symbolic data processing, uh, particularly lists. Uh, and now there are lots of different data types, but uh, and it's way ahead of even more modern languages uh, today. And uh, a lot of the stuff with particularly early Lisp was was related to AI research, trying to design uh, chatbots and complex. Uh, data transformers and uh, expert systems, things of that nature, and Lisp. And Lisp was very good for abstracting away the uh, the bare, barest level of implementation details, uh, as opposed to something like C or Fortran. The author mentions a very good point. If you run Moore's Law in reverse for 20 years, you can imagine how scarce computing resources were on 80s hardware. Yeah, that is... Like, I look at what we have today, and this is all I've ever known, basically, but then I look... I hear about how stuff was back then. Like, how did you do anything with less than a gigabyte of RAM? But they just... They just... They just... They just did. Uh... Yeah, and so Lisp always kind of had to be able to optimize uh, its machine code 
a lot. So in, in, nowadays, a good Lisp compiler can generate machine code quite similar to what might be generated by a C compiler. Um, 80s were also the era of Lisp machines. Um, so companies like Symbolics made computers that basically ran the Lisp environment uh, in hardware. But uh, eventually, they uh, those didn't work out for reasons. Um, also, that the uh, there were so many different dialects of Lisp and you know various various flavors going on. So in 1981, a grassroots group of Lisp hackers got together and began to standardize Common Lisp. Uh, you may note this is after the first implementation of Emacs, I believe. Uh, and so Emacs Lisp, I believe, predates uh, Common Lisp, but uh, but it's actually but it took a lot of inspiration after the fact with uh, with with how things work and stuff. So this whole chapter is just a bit of a a history lesson. Uh, ANSI in 1996 released the Common Lisp standard. Uh, so now we have ANSI Common Lisp, which is what all of the implementations actually do implement. They uh, they implement quite a lot of functions and stuff, but. Uh, they also leave some things up to the implementation itself because there are a whole bunch of different implementations of Common Lisp. And uh, so it's kind of this living fossil of a language. It's, it's ever ancient yet ever new. Uh, if you want to get arcane with it. It's a thoroughly modern general purpose language whose design reflects a deeply pragmatic approach to solving real problems as efficiently and robustly as possible. Uh, only downside of Lisp classical heritage is that lots of folks are still walking around with ideas about Lisp based on some particular flavor of Lisp they were exposed to at some particular time in the nearly half century since McCarthy invented Lisp. If someone tells you Lisp is only interpreted, that it's slow, or that you have to use recursion for everything, Ask them what dialect of Lisp they're talking about uh, and whether they were learning bell bottoms at the time, which is a bit of a jab. But yeah, I mean, people who don't know about Lisp seem to have this weird idea. Like Luke Smith mentioned in a stream several months ago that uh, Lisp is like slower than Python or something. But I don't. I have no idea where he could could have possibly got that information. Um, just just stuff like that. But I learned Lisp once, and it wasn't like what you're describing. If you've used Lisp in the past, you may have ideas about what Lisp is that have very little to do with Common Lisp. Common Lisp has supplanted most of the dialects it's descended from. It isn't the only remaining dialect. Uh, there is also Scheme. Scheme has always been... A, okay, there's also Scheme. Scheme is also a thing that exists. Um, blah, blah, blah. Two other Lisp dialects still in widespread use are eLisp, the extension language for the Emacs editor, and AutoLisp, the extension language for AutoCAD. While it's possible, more lines of eLisp and AutoLisp have been written than any other dialect of Lisp, either can be used outside their host application, debatable, and both are quite old-fashioned Lisps compared to either Steam or Common Lisp. Sure, perhaps, maybe. Ooh, here we go. If you've used one of these dialects, prepare to hop in the Lisp time machine and jump forward several decades. Okay, I am, I am so ready for this. Are you? Oh, nobody's watching right now. Shoot, okay. Who is this book for, though? This book for you is if you're curious about Common Lisp, regardless of whether you're already convinced you want to try it. If you've learned some Lisp but have trouble making the leap from academic exercise or your problems, I have the opposite problem. On the other hand, you don't have to be convinced that you want to use Lisp. 
if you're a pragmatist, then there's pragmatic reasons, and he covers a whole bunch of stuff, and there's a bunch of footnotes that are probably all good, but I'm not going to read them. All right. Time to actually get started with stuff, maybe. I'm watching Welcome One. Uh, YouTube says you're not, but I guess they're just wrong then. Okay, uh, chapter two, the chapters, they're, they're, they're numbers, I think they're chapters. All right, tour the REPL. In this chapter, you set up your programming environment. Um, they're going to use Lisp in a box, which is a, uh, it's a toolkit. Uh, it's, it's like an all, all included Emacs with a uh, common Lisp implementation and slime and all of the integration preset up and stuff. I didn't really care to set that up, so I've just got Emacs over here. I've got a slime open. I made sure that my source blocks, um, I made sure that these source blocks, which it's hard to see because of my font, uh, but basically they are, in fact, truly, uh, I can actually plus, like if I do plus one, two here, and then evaluate, uh, it will put a result there as S3 or something. So uh, we do have Emacs all set up, and obviously if I want to do plus one, two, it's three. Uh, the choosing a Lisp implementation, they waffle a bit about, uh, they mention SBCL because it's the best one. Uh, however, the one that they're actually going to use is Allegro Common Lisp in the book. But again, they're all the same, basically, except for the parts that they're not. But the whole standard of Common Lisp, all of the implementations are the same, uh, have all the same behavior, mostly. I keep I keep putting words on the end there, but like mostly because various like type uh, strictness SB, SBCL um, has more type strictness or something than other implementations, and of course they're all going to run at different speeds. They're optimized differently, uh, but as far as the actual uh, the actual code and the systems go, they're pretty much interchangeable for common applications. Getting up and running with Lisp in a box. Okay, we're not using Lisp in a box. I, we've got Emacs up here. If you don't know Emacs, uh, there's a couple tips about how to get started using it, just, just to be able to use it for other things. You um, can also install something like Evil Mode and do most of things uh, with Vim keys, for example, when I switch Emacs windows up here, I'm doing control W, uh, K to go up and J to go down, and uh, all stuff like that. There are also uh, plugins, common list plugins for other editors. Uh, we're not going to get into that right now, though, either. Free your mind, interactive programming. Uh, when you start, Lisp, you should see a buffer containing this prompt, the CL user. There we go. It's like a shell prompt, but with Lisp. Uh, and this is called the read eval print loop, or REPL for short. Um, I don't like the way that sounds, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and it's called that because uh, you it reads it reads the expression, it evals that expression, and then it prints the result from the eval, and then it starts the loop again and gives you another prompt so you can keep going. Um, other languages are like that too. Python has one. Uh, the Unix shell is a classic example. Uh, Elisp itself also has a REPL. It's called ielm, which you can see over here. Um, same idea. Just looks a little bit different. I'm just gonna kill that buffer though because we don't really need it right now. But yeah, that's that's a thing. Okay. From within the REPL, 
you can uh, redefine variables and functions and stuff. You can evaluate Lisp expressions, of course, and you can load separate files. You can actually compile stuff inside of the REPL. There's a debugger, uh, and you can like step through it and everything. So just just pretty powerful interface for live development, as such. All of those facilities are built into the language, accessible via functions defined in the language standard. If you had to you could build a pretty reasonable programming environment out of just the REPL and any text editor that knows how to indent Lisp code. But the true Lisp programming experience, uh, you need an environment like Slime, which is, which is the, this, as you can see, that lets you interact with Lisp both via the REPL and while editing source files. For instance, you don't want to have to cut and paste a function definition from a source file to the REPL or have to load a whole file just because you change one function. This is true. This is a this is a thing with other languages like uh, last year I was developing a lot of PowerShell for my job and uh, I would make a I would have a file up here I would be writing in it and then uh, I would have to just like copy it and paste it down there and that was a little bit annoying but Lisp you don't even have to do that. You can just send it into the Lisp environment and it'll just affect, it'll just change it live, which is very, very cool. Very underrated feature. More languages should have it, but they kind of can't because of design decisions, which is why, why Lisp is still better than them. So there's different uh, Lisp expressions. It can be evaluated. The simplest expression is something like if you do 10 it just evaluates back 10 because that's a number it's a which numbers are self-evaluating is what that means uh, it means when given to the evaluator it evaluates to itself and then it prints it of course you can actually uh, of course give it more complicated things like I showed plus one two or other, but you could also do you do plus two three and look it gives you five. Ain't that ain't that just nice? Math exists. That's uh, that's what that is. So the first this is basic Lisp. This is the same as any Lisp or Emacs uh, configuration language. The first element of the list is the function to run, and the rest of the elements are arguments for that function. So plus will just take however many numbers you want. Uh, like if we do plus two, three, four, five, six, apparently that's 20. And it just pluses all of them together. That's beautiful. Lisp can evaluate a list expression other ways, but we don't need to get done to those yet. Okay, hello world time. I don't like hello world as a rule, but uh, but it's fine. So the way you do hello world in Lisp is you just type hello world in quotation marks. Boom, got him. Oh wait, I misspelled that. That is, that is hilarious. I totally didn't mean to do that. Hello world. The quotation marks here uh, to delimit a string, they tell the interpreter or the, and the evaluator that it is in fact a string as opposed to uh, like a variable name or something. Like if we go hello, uh, hello is not defined. You see that gives us an error. But a string tells you tells it that uh, it's just supposed to be. Uh, just plain old text. However, this may not really qualify as a hello world program. It's more like the hello world value. That is absolutely correct, and that is my main beef with hello world programs as a whole. You can take a step toward a real program by writing some code that as a side effect prints the string hello world to standard output. Alright, cool. The most flexible way of doing output is the format function. So if you're going to do something like format, 
takes a number of arguments, but the only two required arguments are the place to send the output and a string. We'll see in the next chapter how the string can contain embedded directives that allow you to interpolate, sequence, or subsequent arguments. The format does a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, I'll check this out. It actually uh, shows at the at, at the at the bottom there. You can't you can't see it because I'm pointing like away outside of the view box, but. It, it has the actual type signature down here with uh, the arguments for format itself. So a format expression, uh, if you print, if you put pass true as the first argument, by the way, T is just the symbol tr for, uh, for true as opposed to false, which is nil. Uh, though I think they'll get to that later. So if we do format t hello world, it will print out hello world to the standard output and it will return nil, which is different from uh, stand, which is different from output. The nil on the line after the hello world is a result of evaluating the format expression. Nil is Lisp's version of false and or null. More than chapter four. Okay, so they do get to it later. Chapter four. I was gonna take a tour to tangent to explain that, but I don't think I will now. Excuse me. Unlike the other expressions we've seen so far, a format expression is more interesting for its side effect, printing a standard output in this case, than for its return value, because it because it because remember these lines are doing different things. Every expression in a list evaluates to some result. There is a footnote. Uh, let me go to the footnote. What is footnote number nine? Well, as you'll see when I discuss returning multiple values, it's technically possible to write expression that evaluates to no value, but even such expressions are treated as returning nil when evaluated in a context that represents a value. Okay, so basically it either returns something or it returns nil, which is also something. Got him. Nice. Okay. However, it's still arguable whether you've written, yet written a true program, but you're getting there. And you're going to see the bottom-up style of programming supported by the REPL. You can experiment with different approaches and build a solution from parts you've already tested. Now that you have a simple expression that does what you want, which is this format string, you just need to package it in a function. Functions are one of the basic program building blocks in Lisp. And it can be defined with defun. Okay, that is the same as in Emacs Lisp as well. So if I just scroll over here and we do defun, hello world, and then an empty list, and then bring in the format t hello world. By the way, that uh, what I just did there with like including the list and the other list, that's a plugin I'm using called paredit for Emacs. It's good for editing Lisp type stuff. All right, and that returns hello world in all caps, which is, we'll see, let's see, what does it say there? The, so the first argument to def fun that's hello world is the name of the function. Uh, and they're going to go over uh, how function names actually are allowed to work in chapter four. But, okay, wait, characters such as dash that are illegal in names in other languages are legal in common words. Okay, it's not standard Lisp style to form compound names with hyphens uh, rather than underscores. Wait, wait, what is it saying? I'm confused what it's saying is okay and what's not. So... Most languages don't let you put a hyphen in a function name, but Lisp does. Common Lisp does. I know that ELisp does as well. It is standard. It is standard Lisp style and English to form compound names with hyphens, so like hello dash world, uh, rather than underscores. Nobody uses underscores in natural language, but a lot of programming languages do because they don't have to use hyphens. Uh, and you can highlight, okay, okay, I get what it's saying. 
So what it's saying is what I thought I was saying, which is good, I'm not wrong, uh, which is that you can put whatever characters in the function name you want, mostly, which they'll get into exceptions later, but uh, so you may as well just type it with hyphens because it's easier to read, but uh, yeah, cool, I like that. The parentheses after the name delimit the parameter list, which is empty in this case because uh, the function doesn't actually take any arguments. The rest is the body of the function, which is the same expression as we had before. At one level, this expression, like all the others you've seen, is just another expression to be read, evaluated, and printed by the REPL, because that's what it does. The return value is the name of the function you just defined. But like the format expression, this expression is more interesting for its side effects than it has for its return value. Unlike the format expression, the side effects are invisible. Uh, all you see is the return value. You don't see like a standard output or anything. But you do. Uh, it is actually doing something else in the background. It creates a function, uh, which means that you can now call a function just like we called format before, you can actually call hello world by putting it in parentheses and it returns hello world and also nil because, again, that's what the format command also did. Nice. So far, so basically the same as Emacs Lisp. That's fine. That's good. Functions in common lisp are automatically return the value of the last expression evaluated. Okay. Saving your work. You could argue that this is a complete hello world program of sorts. I wouldn't, but sure, you could. However, it still has a problem. If you exit lisp and restart, the function definition will be gone. Having written such a fine function, you'll want to save your work. Okay. Um... So you just need to make a file uh, to save the function in. So the way you can do that is uh, is by control X, control F. I'm just going to go common lisp uh, practical common lisp dot lisp and Cool. So we create the file, and you can type the definition you previously implemented at the REPL. Wait, what does it say? What is it trying to get me to do? And is there a way that I can do it better? I'm overthinking this. All right, I'm just going to type it in manually. So we can do defun hello world um, Oh look, it has the uh, type signature there. You can see it's actually showing up in a little window. That's an Emacs uh, plugin I have. It's called LDoc Box. It doesn't matter for now. Uh, it'll always show at the bottom there as well. So we can start putting format t hello comma world ah, and then they have the, the quotes and the parentheses are there for us because I've got other plugins nice simultaneous arguments expected and it shows like if we go it shows if I go like like that defun name lambda list wait lambda list okay I guess that's that's an implementation of detail and rest body message disappears when you type a new element but it'll reappear uh, when you enter a space cool uh, that is also the same as elisp I'm surprised that this actually is working for common lisp it's been not working in previous times but 
that that's also good I guess when you're entering the definition of the file you might choose to break the definition across two lines after the parameter list uh, so if I just want to uh, be entering viewer hit return and then tab or I didn't even need to hit tab there it will do that Slime also helps matching the parentheses. Uh, if you put a parenthesis, it will flash the other parenthesis. My setup just holds, it just highlights the other parenthesis also. I forget what the exact setting for that in Emacs is, but it's easy to Google. Um, you can also do Control C, Control Q which doesn't seem to work, uh, but the command that, it, that it's supposed to be bound to is slime, paren, uh, slime close all parens in S expression. That's similar. Uh, we broken. Wait, okay. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, it's trying to give us it's trying to give us basic Emacs information, and I'm so beyond that level that it, the basic stuff doesn't even work anymore. Doesn't matter. Just balance your parentheses, guys, because otherwise everything will fail. Uh, slime per close parens at point. We'll insert as many closing parentheses as necessary to match all the currently open parentheses. I'll take your word for it, bro. Now you can get the definition to your Lisp environment in several ways. Okay, this is the cool part. Easiest is to type uh, control C, control C, anywhere in or immediately after the def un. And so control C, control C. And you can see it actually changed in the repo there, which runs the command slime compile def un. Okay, which sends it to Lisp to be evaluated and compiled. So for example, if we wanted to change these to uppercase, we could just change the letters. Maybe, maybe it's a little bigger there. Yeah, if we wanted to change this to uppercase, we could just change the letters and then control C, control C, and it will redefine it. And then if we go uh, hello world again, it will display hello world with capital letters. Very nice. You probably also want to save the file, which you can do with Control X, Control S, uh, which saves it. If you're using evil mode, Control W, or sorry, colon W also saves it because that's what, what it is in Vim. Now, to try reloading the function from the source file, you'll need to quit list and restart. Okay. Quit. You can use a slime shortcut. The REPL type a comma. Wait. Comma and Emacs will prompt you for a command. Type uh, Sayunara. Uh, and hit enter. And it'll ask a buffer has a running process. Kill it. Yes. Okay, apparently we're selecting the deleted buffer now. So now, uh, I'm gonna go meta x slime, enter. Uh, it wants to, it's I got a warning about version numbers, doesn't matter. And here we are back in put this window, uh, make this window a little bit bigger and make the text in it a lot bigger. Nice. Is that visible in the stream? I hope it is. I've, I can see from my preview that it should, it definitely should be, but I don't know. I know this, this text in the, in the browser is not visible. Oh well. Just for grins, we can try to invoke hello world. Let's do it and see what happens. Oop, doesn't work. The function uh, common list user hello world is undefined. Condition of type undefined function. And it pops up this buffer uh, with complaints about stuff not working. And I'm trying 
and two are good. Okay, come on. All right. Um, there we go. Okay, that's a better window configuration. Uh, so it's like kind of in the middle there. I was going to have my org file open, but it looks like we won't need it yet. Blamu, oh no, what happened? You try to invoke a function that doesn't exist. And it, uh, instead of just bailing or failing or anything, it gives you a whole bunch of options. Um, what I did earlier and what you can do again if, if you want is just uh, press Q. And I will exit the debugger just like normal, which is fine. And I'll say evaluation aborted. That's all it says in their example with their implementation. But SBCL actually gives you uh, a memory address, I believe this is, for it and the name of the error itself, which is pretty nice. And in chapter 19, we'll go back to the debugger, but for now, it's not that important. You just quit out of it with Q. So what happened there was we didn't have the function hello world defined because we haven't reloaded our uh, Lisp file. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can load the Lisp file. We can do control C, control C. Or you can load the whole file, which would be a more convenient approach if it contained a bunch of definitions using the load function, which is what we're going to do because it's more interesting. So we load, and it was called um, practical common lisp dot lisp, and it returned true. The T means everything loaded correctly. Hooray. Loading a file with load is essentially equivalent to typing each of the expressions in the file at the REPL in the order that they appear in the file. So after the call to load, hello world should be defined. Awesome, let's try it. Hello world returns hello world and nil because of the format function. Boom, that's, that's how you do it, man. Another way to load a file's worth of definitions is to compile the file first with compile file and then load the resulting compiled file which is a fazl file short for fast load file compile file returns the name of the fazl file so we can compile and load uh, from the REPL like so so we load uh, compile file practical common lisp dot lisp Boom. Wait, what? So it uh, it says compiling file with the name of the file it's doing, and it gives us a timestamp. Very nice of you, SBCL, to do that. Apparently, Allegro does not do that. Wrote common lisp dot fazl compilation finished in zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds, and zero milliseconds because there was only one function in there. Nice. Slime also provides support for loading and compiling files without using the REPL. When you're in a source code buffer, like uh, like this one, you can just use uh, control C, control L to load a file with slime load file. Very nice. And it returns T, as you can see in this message up here and down there. This, by the way, this little notification box is a, an Emacs extension I wrote. It just makes everything look a little bit nicer. Don't worry about it. Prompts for file name, and then you just enter. Uh, or you can type Control-C, Control-K to compile and load the file already filled. Wait. Represented by the current buffer. Control-C, Control-K. Wait. Control-C, Control-K compiles again, compilation finished, no warnings, 
0, 0.00 seconds. Very nice. It's that easy to just compile it. I never knew that. I thought it was like some weird secret hack. In some common Lisp implementations, compiling code this way will make it quite a bit faster, but in others it won't. Uh, typically because they always compile everything. Uh, that might be the same thing as JIT compilation or just in time, I'm not sure. Probably predates it though. This should be enough to give you a flavor of how Lisp programming works. That is, that's pretty fun, honestly. Of course, I haven't covered all the tricks and techniques yet, but you've seen the essential elements of the REPL and basic Emacs integration. Serious Lisp packers often keep a Lisp image running for days on end. Okay, so it's kind of the same thing as like hacking an Emacs config. Also, even when the Lisp app is deployed, there's often still a way to get to a REPL. You'll see in Chapter 26 how you can use the REPL and Slime to interact with the Lisp that's running a web server at the same time as it's serving up web pages. Wow. It's even possible to use Slime to connect to a Lisp running on a different machine, allowing you, for instance, to re debug a remote server just like a local one. There is a very interesting story. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, debugging... Lisp in space. In deep space. Um, yeah, that's a website. This is the one. There's a news. Which, uh, which satellite is that? Debugging software that is running 150 million miles away is something most of us will never do, thankfully. But one former NASA programmer, software engineer Ron Garrett, shared his experience on diagnosing faulty Lisp software on a deep space spacecraft mission in one recent episode of this uh, podcast by this guy. Um, just kind of going over like his experience programming, which changed everything. They were working on... Okay... A chat saying ripples are a mess it's easy to use them for small things for large more complex tasks it's very hot that's why we've got like uh, other other stuff like control C uh, control whatever it was that just evaluates the function so back in the day uh, Lisp was a language that they would use on spacecraft and rovers and things because uh, it was the it was the most advanced thing and had the best uh, the best abstractions. With Lisp, every problem becomes a compiler problem, and it was just so good. Uh, but NASA didn't use it much because they didn't like the syntax or something. Also, garbage collection was confusing back then. Uh, Garris Group found it useful for memory constrained hardware. Lisp could be used to fashion a custom language specifically for the problem at hand, and this is something we'll get into later I believe where are okay let's get to the, the, the failure bit the fun part so they made a, a small like subset language trying to avoid race conditions and uh, and they put it on the spacecraft and it didn't work So that there was a time at which it was supposed to do something, and the time came and went, and it didn't do the thing it was supposed to do, uh, and that was bad. Because they had, they had tested it and it worked. It would work. It worked here, but now it's 150 million miles away from the Earth. Okay, bye. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going like like nobody left. I don't know if I've got any viewers left or not, but whatever. The tense situation, we had no idea what was going on. Everything that we did when we decided on to do something, we would do it and then we'd sit around and wait an hour for the result. <sighs> that's right, because that's so far away, man. The light, the speed of light just isn't fast enough for that. So, they requested a backtrace. Um, there was this one process that was waiting for something that should have already happened. Uh, and despite all of that optimization, there was still a race condition. <sighs> Wait. 
So, uh, basically, they, uh, they were able to pop open a debugger on a Lisp image running on a spacecraft and make it work by reaching in with the REPL. And they didn't lose the spacecraft and they did accomplish all the mission objectives. Can you share the repo of your Emacs package? Um, yeah, let me let me put it in chat here. The the noti the notification box I take it you mean is uh, uh, get I believe it's that one. It's either that. Or, okay, wait, what? Does YouTube let me do that? It does. Wait, okay, apparently that's not. Uh, hang on just a second, that one's not valid. Nor is that, okay, uh, it must be. Uh, it must be, hang on, uh, can I delete this message? It's not right. Uh, remove. Wait, what? Okay. No, okay. Oh, no, no, no. It's on my GitHub. Uh, it's, uh, okay, here it is. This is the, this is the actual repo. Uh, it should be on there. I'm not sure if it is or not. But, uh, yeah, I don't have documentation or anything. It's not very good, but it is there. It works, kind of. Works well enough for me, and nobody else cared. Um, so, yeah, this, uh, this side note about uh, running Lisp on spacecraft... After that thing, there was uh, there was politics, and it just wasn't good enough to uh, to win out, and so they started using other languages that are a bit worse. Uh, with the rationale given as an attempt to follow quote unquote best practices, uh, which he would argue that they're confusing it with standard practice, which is not the same. Um, and nowadays, they kind of use Lisp as a jumping off point to write uh, write their own custom language for uh, interacting with other stuff. And they think that it is still being used at NASA in some capacity. So that's the story of of that time that they opened up a Lisp debugger on a spacecraft 150 million miles away. And I think that's kind of fun. Fun fun story to be like, yeah, they used it in space, and even though something broke, they could still get it to work again because of Lisp. Um, they actually do... Oh! Okay, I jumped the gun a little bit. They actually do mention this in the book. Deep Space One mission in 1998. When the bug manifested in the wild, 100 million miles away from Earth, the team was able to diagnose and fix the running code, allowing the experiments to complete. And the REPL was the reason that was even possible. You're not quite ready to send any Lisp code into deep space, but in the next chapter, you'll take a crack at writing a program a bit more interesting than Hello World. And they've got footnotes about, hey, what if you hate Emacs, then just get over it. What if other things, don't worry about it. All right, cool. If the load doesn't go cleanly, we'll return something other than true. Uh, because remember when we loaded that file and it just worked. If it doesn't work, it'll it'll error. Uh, that's fine. 
Okay. Practical stuff time. I'm gonna take my sunglasses off. This is hurting my uh my, my ear holes. My 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 ear. What's the what's like the the the, the part of your ear that the the glasses like to sit on? I don't know. Okay. Time to make a simple database. It says. Before you can start building real software in Lisp, you'll have to learn a language. You know, let's face it, you may be thinking, practical common Lisp isn't that an oxymoron. Why should you be expected to bother learning all the details of a language unless it's actually good for something you care about? Okay, time to, time to actually do stuff. And uh, a simple database for keeping track of CDs. CDs. Okay, this just dated this book. Common Lisp is like kind of outside of time because of how good it is, but like talking about CDs. Uh, that. Oh, okay, they do mention MP3s. Maybe this isn't written in the past. <laughs> so, okay. You could think of this as part of the MP3 project, which is later. Um, I do have a directory on my system with a bunch of mp3s, but they're actually uh, flax technically. I mean technically they're like internally they're mp3s, but um, Externally they're flax because I don't know flax are better apparently. I heard flax were better somewhere and now I just make everything look like a flax In this chapter I'll cover just enough lisp as we go along for you to understand how the code works uh, don't sweat the small stuff. Terminology note. Common Lisp provides three distinct kinds of operators. Functions, macros, and special operators. For the purpose of this chapter, you don't really need to know the difference. Uh, but then you will be describing them, uh, do, doing, the, doing the right names for them anyway. Okay, so keep track of CDs that need to be ripped to MP3s and which CDs should be ripped first. Each record in the database will contain the title and artist of the CD, a rating of how much the user likes and a flag saying whether it should be ripped. Okay, so just basic information. So you'll need a way to represent a single database record, let's say one CD. Common Lisp gives you lots of choices of data structures from a simple four item list to a user defined class using the Common Lisp object system, which we're not going to get into right now because that's way too much work, probably. For now, you can stay at the simple end of the spectrum and just use a list. Uh, so we can make a list with the list function. So we just do list and then you know put whatever uh, arguments you want list one two three is one two three one two three four is one two three four very nice understandable have a great day you could use a four item list um, just kind of keeping track of what member is what thing but you can also use a property list which is also called a p list p list is a list where every other element is a symbol that describes what the next element in the list is, which is uh, symbols not not particularly important. It's like a name. A uh, symbol that names the field is a keyword symbol, which just means it has a colon in front of it. So here's an example of a plist using keyword symbols A, B, and C as property names. So we could do list colon A is one colon B, two, colon C, three. And that returns uh, the list with the same but uppercase, which is how you know that it's actually like in the interpreter. So that's just a P list. Uh, it's basically just a bunch of keyword, key value pairs all thrown into the list all at once. Nice. The thing that makes plists uh, 
convenient way to represent the records in a database is the function get f, which takes a plist and a symbol and returns the value in the plist following the symbol, making a plist a sort of man, poor man's hash table. Okay, which is it's just key value pairs. Lisp has real hash tables too, but plists are sufficient for your needs and are easier to save to files and stuff. Honestly, Lisp hash tables, at least Emacs Lisp hash tables are a little bit underpowered. Oh, there, it's snowing outside. Is my S buzzy, by the way? I'm, I'm self-conscious about that. It's always been a problem for me, but anyway. So we've got, uh, so let's just try uh, get F get f on that list with uh, and the one we want to get out of it is uh, zoo colon a so colon a corresponds to one in that list and so it returns one very nice what about if we do colon c that returns three yay that makes sense I like that given all that you can easily make a function make cd that will tell the four fields as arguments and return a plist representing that cd okay wait so if we wanted to uh defun make cd with a title and an artist and a rating and a strip and a ripped Now let's make that fit on a line. Uh, so we want that to return a list, which uh, is just a plist of all of those with the names okay, uh, that's pretty simple. I don't like the way it looks. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little bit of wait just do a little bit of formatting there make it look a little bit nicer because line spacing I and mean, like like doesn't actually matter in Lisp it just makes it look nice so that's our uh, that's a make cd function for us and uh, I can do control c control c and that will actually uh, load it into the REPL as we saw in the last chapter uh, so the as it says the list there after the name of the function is for the parameters and the body of the function is just one function which is a list which, which is the list function and it just creates a list with all of the stuff in it. So now if we wanted to go into the REPL here, we could do make CD. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with this artist. Uh, so that would be as you can see down here or up here, it actually shows us the type signature for that function already, which is make CD with the title slot and the artist and the rating and ripped. So for example, uh, make CD is the name of the function and that string is the title and that string is the artist and then the rating and then whether or not it's ripped enter and that will return us a symbol a return us a p list with the title and an artist and a rating and whether or not it's ripped and that all matches what the happened in the functions a single record however doth not a database make it needs some larger construct to hold the records and for simplicity's sake, a list seems like a good choice. Also, for simplicity, you can use a global variable, variable name DB, which you can define with the def var macro. Okay, that is also the same as in Emacs Lisp.
Asterisks are just a naming convention for global variables. So we can uh, def var star db star as nil. And that just creates an empty variable db. Can use push to add items to db. It's probably a good idea to abstract things a tiny bit. So you should define a function uh, called add record. Define add record taking one argument which is a CD and the body of it uh, just pushes CD onto DB. Cool. Uh, let's also put a def var DB nil. Nice. And then control C, control C evaluates that add record function. So that's basically just a trivial wrapper or a very simple wrapper around the push function, but that's okay. So now we can add record. Um, and we can make, let's say, make CD uh, for roses by Kathy Matea with uh, a rating of seven and definitely ripped. And that will return a list with the list that the make CD returned. And that's just gotta do with push. So let's add another one. We can add record uh, make CD fly. Oh, I, I realized I misspelled something earlier. Doesn't matter. Fly by the Dixie chicks uh, as rating eight. True, I am not endorsing this person's music choices, uh, this music music tastes, by the way. But as you can see, it does show uh, two things in there now. It's got um, both of the items we've added to our db variable. So that's nice. Uh, let's do one more add record. I'm gonna deviate from the script a little bit and add holiday by uh, green day. And I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. And I definitely ripped that from YouTube. Oh dear. Simple program error. Invalid number. What? Oh, oh, I see what I did. So what I did is I forgot to put the make CD in there. So add record only takes one argument, which is the CD, but the CD has to be returned from make CD. So just do make CD and then slurp all of those arguments into it. Boom, there we go. So we've got a, so DB is now a list of three lists, each of which is a P list with the title and artist a rating and whether or not it's ripped. Cool. I'm going to eat a cheese ball because nobody's here. So if you wanted to just check what the db was at any time, you can just go star db star, and that displays the value of the variable as it did before. <clears throat> Ooh. Oh no. However, that's not a very satisfying way of looking at the output. You can write a dump db function that dumps out the database in a more human readable format like that. That looks nice. Function looks like this. Uh, so we go into fun, dump db, 
which do, uh, which contains do list. I believe that loops over a list of things, so which is similar to for loops. So for each CD in the DB, uh, we're going to format true, and then this weird string, um, which is tilde bracket or brace tilde a colon tilde 10 t tilde a tilde percent tilde close brace tilde percent end quote and then the cd okay uh and I just control c control c that there it goes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. I thought something weird happened because the display changed, but it's fine. It's fine. So that all right. Admittedly, the format call is a little cryptic. However, format isn't particularly more complicated than C or Perl's printf function or Python string percent interpreter. In chapter 18, I'll discuss format in greater detail. Okay, good. Because format. I was just starting to get the hang of how format works in Elisp, and this is way more confusing. As we saw in chapter two, though, format just takes uh, at least two arguments. Uh, the first argument is where the stream sends its output, and t just is, means standard output. The second is the uh, format string which contains literal text and or directives uh, for how to interpret the rest of the arguments, which are all just variables or whatever. Okay. So A is the aesthetic directive. It means to consume one argument and output it in a human readable form. So that renders the keywords without deleting colons and strings without a question mark which means that, for example, if you wanted to do, why is, okay, I don't know, I don't care, it doesn't matter. If you wanted to format true aesthetically, uh, say Dixie Chicks in quotes, it will return that without, I'm sorry, it'll print that without the quotation marks. That's nice. And if you, for example, do a uh, colon keyword, it will print it without the colon. Nice. The T directive is for tabulating. 10T uh, tells it to just put a bunch of tabs or spaces there so you're in the 10th column. Again, the, the output we want is going to look like this. Okay. Basically, format strings are black magic, and I don't want anything to do with them. So if it's possible... Okay, so basically these loops are just looping over stuff. And there are ways of doing this without do list, but we're not going to bother with them right now. So now, if I wanted to just dump DB, it uh, it returns exactly that—a big old list of a, a big old tabulated dump of all of our items in our database.
All right, next up, improving the user interaction. That right there that we did, <clears throat> it's too lispy. Way too much code on the screen for an army. A casual user, as they so kindly euphemize it. If they want to add a bunch of records, it's also not very convenient. So you want to write a function to prompt the user for information about a set of CDs. Right away, you know you'll need some way to prompt the user for a piece of information and read it. Uh, so let's write that. So, def on a prompt read, I guess, with a prompt as the argument. A format query dash IO aesthetic colon space prompt. Oh, I see what it's going to do. So that is going to welcome to the stream if you're just joining us, by the way. Uh, working through practical common list. This is chapter three, I think. Uh, and they've got us designing this like database thing. I'm just basically copying the code in the book indirectly. Never copy paste code, always like type it, retype it out yourself so you know what's going on. So they want you to force output uh, query IO. and read line. I don't know what all this does, but I sure hope they'll explain it. All right, uh, and that is now in the system. So we're using format again to enter the prompt, to omit the prompt. I'm, I'm starting to really hate format with every fiber of my being now. It seems like it does way too much. It has way too much functionality. I mean, seriously, what is going on with this thing? Uh, <clears throat> there's no tilde percent, so the cursor stays on the same line. Okay, I guess that's a rule. Force output is necessary in some implementations. To ensure the Lisp doesn't wait for a new line before it prints the prompt. Hmm. Then you can read a single line of text with the aptly named read line function. The variable query IO is a global variable, which you can tell because of the stars in the naming convention. It contains the input stream connected to the terminal. Wait, so. So that means that it's already got. A value right now doesn't it yes it does and it's a weird object value that I don't know what to do with cool so query IO is just a built-in variable nice a return value of prompt read will be the value of the last form the call to read line which returns the string it read without the trailing okay I'm not sure what that has to do with anything you can combine your existing make CD function with prompt read and build a function that makes a new CD record from data it gets by prompting for each value in turn. Okay, I like that. I like that actually. That's that's some nice um, user user simplifying. So we're going to define a function with a def fun and it's called prompt for CD takes no arguments directly, but uh, does make CD, which we can find up there, uh, just makes a plist with, uh, with all of the arguments in it as a plist. And the first argument is a prompt for the title. The second argument is a prompt for the artist. Third argument is a prompt 
for the rating. And the fourth argument is a prompt for uh, whether or not it is ripped. And uh, I'm just going to ask yes or no. Cool. Control C, Control C to evaluate that function. That's almost right, except prompt read returns a string, which is fine for a title and artist, but is not right for rating because that should be a number, and prompt read should be a yes or no value. Or, sorry, rip should be a yes or no value. So there's different ways you can sanitize and like fix the types of the input. Uh, but we're just going to do the easy way right now, the quick and dirty way, which is using parse integer uh, for rating. So like parse integer uh, property rating. And it's going to signal an error if it can't parse the integer out of the box. Or if there's any non-numeric stuff in the string. But it also does take the optional argument junk allowed, junk allowed, true. Uh, if it can't find an integer amidst all the junk, parse integer will just return nil rather than a number. In keeping with the quick and dirty approach, you may want to just call nil or zero and continue. The Lisp or macro is what we need for this because uh, it just returns the first one that's not nil. So, so we're going to do that parse integer expression or zero, whichever is. Uh, if parse integer returns a valid number, it's not going to put zero. It's not going to get to the zero, but if it returns nil, it is going to get to the zero. So that's nice. Fix and code the prompt for ripped is quite a bit simpler. You can just use the common lisp function wire np. So instead of prompt read here, we would go y or np. This is also in elisp. Wait, what does that do? It does nothing. Uh, I guess. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. I tried to like evaluate it in place, but because I, I wasn't sure if it would work, uh, but I also thought it might happen in Elisp, and so then it would just go through the native Emacs UI, but apparently didn't because slime integration is actually good. In fact, this is the most robust prompt part of the prompt because it'll re-prompt the user if they enter something that isn't yes or no. So that's nice. Def prompt for CD gives us now this uh, this better function here. So it prompts reads uh, title and the artist and does some error checking for the rating, which will try to get whatever number you type if you type anything and if you don't type anything that's number like it'll just return zero instead. And then whether or not you ripped it is using a built-in. Like it. Do really like that. Awesome. Finally, you can finish the add a bunch of CDs interface by wrapping prompt by wrapping prompt for CD in a function that loops until the user is done. You can use the simple form of the loop macro, which repeatedly executes a body of expressions until it's exited by a call to return. For example, if we go defun add CDs, uh, we're loop, gonna loop add record prompt for CD. Okay, add record pushes it onto the onto the database variable. Prompt for CD is the function we just wrote that does the UI stuff. And then if not, 
Yes or no? The another Oh, uh, it's going to return. And if it doesn't return, it's going to do that. Loop, now loop is uh, just kind of thrown in here, but loop is actually very complicated and cool. Uh, we're not going to get into it right now. There is a chapter on loop, apparently, in the future. Now you can use add CDs to add CDs uh, to the database. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my REPL window a little bit bigger so we can uh, increase the size a bit and then we're going to go add CDs. Oh, oh no, what happened? Okay. Um, hit this window. Oh, it opens another window. That's weird. I don't like that. Uh, that's just a problem with my Emacs though, I think. So the title we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put uh, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Uh, artist is Green Day. Okay, every time it's opening another window, and I don't know why. All right, rating. I'm gonna rate Boulevard of Broken Dreams a nine point five out of ten. is ripped okay this is interesting so the wire n here says says it has two wire ends one of them was from the function we made the other i guess is just built into wire np so is it ripped yes like hell it's ripped wait okay and that didn't work because i messed up something up so you're gonna say why Another one. Yeah, let's do another one. I keep I keep having to go around. Okay, so we're gonna add um what's a song that won't be embarrassing. I'm bad at songs that aren't embarrassing. I wanna try some you know what? Screw it, I wanna try something. I wanna try entering Screw it, okay. That's not the correct... Those aren't the correct characters for the name of the song. But I don't care anymore. I'm just going to try entering Japanese characters. Um, I will give Hari Hari Yukai a solid 7.9 out of 10. And it was indeed ripped. Is there another? No, let's not do another one. And it just returns nil. So the problem there, what the problem that happened was it kept creating more windows. It kept splitting my Emacs window. And I think that's because of my configuration. Uh, and for now, we're just going to ignore it. Saving and loading the database. Having a convenient way to add records to the database is nice. But let me actually check the database variable. I'm curious now. Boom, it actually does. It shows the Unicode characters just fine. That's beautiful. I love it. So we've got this variable, it's got all this information, all this data in it. Um, but if you like shut down Lisp or shut down the computer or something, you obviously don't 
want the user to have to re-enter it every time. So we should be saving it to a file probably. Luckily with the data structures you're using to represent data, it's trivially easy to save the data to a file and reload it later. Here's a save db function that takes a file name as an argument and saves the current state of the database. So we're just going to return to our function file buffer and we're going to define save db uh, to a file name and with open file. Oh, okay, this is how Common Lisp does writing to files. Because you don't only really think about it when you're programming Emacs, because file IO is just so native because it's like a text editor, but out file name, direction, output. exists super seed apparently that's what you want to put with standard IO syntax I guess that's opposed to non-standard IO syntax I want to print DB out so out is the uh, variable of with open file takes, I guess. <clears throat> with open file macro opens a file, binds the stream to a variable, executes a set of expressions, and then closes the file. Okay, so it's similar like with current buffer in Elast or something. It also makes sure that the file is closed even if something goes wrong while it's evaluating the body. The list go directly after with open file there. It's a, not a function call, uh, but it's part of the syntax of with open file. And uh, the first thing in the list is the variable of the stream itself, which in this case we're calling out. Aha, uh -huh, called out. Am I right? What? And this the value, the second one here is the file name, and it's got to be a file name. And then a bunch of options to control how the file is opened. Here you specify that you're writing, for, you're opening the file for writing with direction output. That you want to overwrite an existing file of the same name if it exists with, uh, if exists supersede. Okay. I'm not a super fan of how they're using uh, colon keywords for that, but it's fine, I guess. Once you have the file open, all you have to do is print the contents of the database with print db to out. Unlike format, print prints lists objects in a form that can be read back in by the Lisp reader. The macro with standard IO syntax, which is here I mentioned earlier, ensures that certain variables that affect the behavior of print are set to their standard values. Okay, it just prevents non-standard syntax. That's what I thought. We'll use the same again when we want to read it back into the uh, the, the system interpreter uh, so that it's operating compatibly. The argument to save DB should be a string containing the name of the file where the user wants to save the database. The exact form of the string will depend on what operating system you're using. Uh, on Unix, it's just a file name. On Windows, it's got to be relative to the C drive or whatever. Um, but we're not on Windows. So let's just uh, save db to home slash my cds.db I feel like there should definitely be a better file extension than that because db files are usually like binary for like SQL servers and stuff but I don't know so now we can actually um, open my cds.db 
in a separate window or something and look at that it's a bunch of data it's all of this data that's nice and it's just it's the same thing as it showed in in there and my emacs is complaining about stuff that doesn't matter not important All right, time to, do you know Japanese? Not really, I'm just a weeb. I'm like kind of trying to learn it slowly. I, I just finished learning the katakana, but I can't like read them with any speed. It takes me ages to sound them out. So that's about where I am. I know like two or three kanji maybe. I was driving by somewhere that had Japanese on the sign and I could, I like recognized the radicals in the kanji the other day and it was cool. Um, yeah, so we're gonna define a function to load the DB back in. So that's cool. Defun load DB, uh, which takes a file name with open file. in because remember with how with open file works file name and with the standard syntax set f db to uh, read in oh dear that looks low level. Let's uh, let's confirm though. Let's confirm how low level it actually is. You need to specify direction with the uh, with open file because the default is input. Instead of printing, you do read uh, to to read from the stream in. Uh, it's the same read that's used by the REPL, and it can read any Lisp expression you type in. Um, but in this case, we're just reading and saving the expression instead of evaluating it again. Because it's a read eval print, and each of those is like an actual function. <sighs> you know, we were talking about the REPL earlier, the read eval print loop, but I just realized read is actually like reading from the syntax. Eval is evaluating an expression that, that's like brought in by... Like the way that you make a redeval print, this is this is so awesome. The way that the way that you do a REPL, the, the way that you would implement a REPL would just be um, read. You you would you would make a loop uh, that just reads and evals and then prints. Obviously, this code doesn't work because you'd have to like do a do like variables in there and stuff. But like that's the idea, though, isn't isn't that just the coolest thing? I get it now. I get why the rep. I get why people go nuts over the REPL. I thought it was just like. Then that's the beauty of Lisp, isn't it? And it's just implementation is just. You look at it; it's so obvious. It's like how else would you do it? And meanwhile, um bash land we've got all of these weird shell quoting rules and globs and completion engines and it's like no nah, you don't you don't need that you just you just you just read and you eval and you print and then you loop back around so set f is the assignment operator so it sets the first argument to the result of the second argument in this case um, it's the value of db to the result of read in and read is evaluating. Ooh, okay. I saw I've got learning that doesn't help in struggling English. Yeah, I've heard English is, is very difficult to learn. 
I'm, I've, I've been very fortunate in that it's my first language. But, like, I look at other languages, like, how would anyone else, like, I mean, some, some parts of English are, I guess it's like any language, some parts of English are easy, like, a lot of words are just always the same, they don't need that, they don't, they don't change form like they do in some other languages, but other stuff, like spelling and irregular verbs and like where to put stuff the nice thing about english though i don't know it's like on the internet when you go like so people who on the internet say they speak a little bit of english they're like fluent basically i mean sometimes you can they'll make a spelling error and they'll like apologize for their english a little bit they're, like, they're great at english but <laughs> but people who are fluent People who, um, English, native English speakers who will be in like a, a different language form will say, oh yeah, I, I only speak a little bit, and then they're like actually terrible. So it's just, it's like people who are learning English know English better than native speakers, straight up. And it wasn't until I had to study other languages that I really understood um, English itself, really. And it's just all... It's just all a big old mess, and it's not ideal, but it's the way things are now, so... Uh, unfortunately, we can't all speak Common Lisp. I'm gonna just write this file, save it, just in case something bad happens. The stream hasn't crashed yet today, which is probably because I've got a much stabler setup that I don't like as much. Anyway... Uh, set f sets a variable to a value, which is the result of a thing. The thing we need to be careful careful about is that load db clobbers whatever was in db before the call. So if you've added records with uh, with add record or add CDs that haven't been saved with save db, you'll lose them. Okay, that makes sense. It's a cache invalidation kind of thing. Querying the database. Now that you have a way to save and reload the database to go along with the convenient user interface for adding new records. The words are spinning before my eyes. All right. Soon they have enough records that you don't want to be dumping out the whole database just to look at what's in it. What you need is a way to query the database to get just a little bit out of it. For example, to select uh, things from the artist Dixie Chicks in the database and get all the list get a list of all the records where, where that's the artist but none of the other ones. Again it turns out that the choice of saving the records in a list will pay off. Lisp is called list processing and uh, that's what it's good at. So the function remove if not does stuff depending on a condition And it's not actually removing the original list, it's just creating a new one that's different, maybe. So it's like, it's similar to grepping, apparently, is what it says. If you're familiar with, with bash. Predicate argument can be any function that accepts a single argument or returns uh, true or false. So if we wanted to remove, if not, function even p, which the hash quote there is, it's a lisp uh, convention of, of naming the function names, the lisp works the same way, probably. And let's just get all the numbers, 7, 8, 9, 10. And that's just going to return all the numbers that are even because it removes all of the ones that are not even. That's all this means. It's kind of, the syntax isn't completely clear. But so it'll check one. Okay, is one even? No. And the way it knows is because of even p, the function. So like, for example, even p one is nil. 
uh, but even p2 is true. That is how that works, and the uh, practical upshot of that is that remove if not will uh, will filter out results that aren't true by that function. You can also pass remove if not an anonymous function. For instance, even if even p didn't exist, you could write the ex previous expression as, um, oh dear. Okay, remove if not hash quote lambda of x. Now we check if equals zero mod of x and two, one, two, three, and then the list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And again, that returns two, four, six, eight, ten. So that predicate there was an anonymous function, which is a lambda. Lambdas are Lambdas are certainly a thing. Um, they're going to get to it later, I believe. Lambda is not the name of a function. It's an indicator that you're defining an anonymous function. Um, other than the lack of a name, a lambda expression is just like a defun, though. Uh, it's lambda followed by a parameter list, which is followed by the body of the function. It's like you're inlining an expression. It's like in bash if you did that. Uh, and then you did whatever command. Okay. Uh, I got a text, but I don't think it's critical that I answer right away. Okay. So... The reason that we're talking about remove if not is so that uh, we can use it on our database variable. Uh, and we, so we need a function that returns true in the artist field is Dixie Chicks and not when it's not. Remember, we chose the plist representation for the database records because gitf can extract named fields from a plist. So assuming, okay. So cd is the name of a variable holding a single database record. You can just get f the colon artist from cd with that syntax to extract the name of the artist. And the way you compare is with equal. Equal is a nice little function. When giving string arguments, compares them character by character. Uh, so equal get fcd on artist get f uh, from cd the artist value if that's equal to dixie chicks uh, that tests whether it's equal so we just wrap that in wait so wait do, is cd defined cd is not defined so we're going to um wait set q i guess I know I don't know if comma lisp is a big big with set q, but I know that set f is the thing. So we're gonna try with uh, just making a cd variable. And we're going to make it the car of db, I guess. And so now CD is the car, is just a plist like we needed in the first place. Car we'll get to later, it doesn't really matter. It's the same in Elisp if you're familiar with that. Basically it's just the first element of the list. And it's called that car for historical reasons. So now we can uh, try the whole remove if not. And the 
comparer function is a lambda taking CD uh, comparing whether it is equal the uh, get F whether the artist in the CD is the same as I want it to be true so I'm going to use a different thing and then two closing parentheses to get out of lambda and we're checking the db variable and that is going to return the one that it is true in oh Oh, we don't even need the CD variable because it's locally bound by the Lambda. So if we wanted to change this to uh, Dixie Chicks, it would get out the Dixie Chicks song. And if we wanted to get the um, Green Day, it would get out both of the Green Day songs because I put two in there. Hooray! Okay, this is actually kind of coming together. Obviously though, that is terrible syntax. No user is going to want to ever write that or even look at it. So we're just gonna wrap it inside of a function. Defun select by artist. Takes an argument artist and it remove remove if if not a completion actually working for once lambda takes a cd and compares whether the uh get f cd artist and artist are the same in the DB and then to close the parentheses. So I'm just going to process that function. The hang on the lambda. Doesn't get run until uh, the remove if not actually you don't need hash a uh, hash quote in recent list because you don't like the syntax i do it's useful and i know that you don't but um that's how they're doing it in the book so i figure we may as well stick with that it's actually helpful to see it i know that you can refer with you can refer to just plain old functions with quote Move if not lambda. Yeah. That is also a thing. So it can refer to variable artist because it's bound within the def un. It lets you derive. Okay, so the, the reason the lambda can have variables in it is because. The lambda doesn't actually get evaluated until that variable is already being defined. Cool. So it's like a hidden parameter, but good. So we can select by artist. Uh, there's other kinds of selecting that exist. Like select by title, select by rating, select by title and artist. There's a whole bunch of different ways of doing stuff like that. Um, but they're based, they'd all be the same. They're just wrappers around or move if, if not. So, as it says, we can just define a select function uh, which takes the select or function, uh, remove if not, selector, then. Okay. 
Cool, so we've got select. So what happened to this hash, hash quote? You don't need it at all. Oh yeah, because selector function is a variable, not a function. Oh yeah. Sorry, I am. I don't know. I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> this is this is focus. I'm gonna eat a cheese ball. So using our select function, we can, of course, query equal get f cd art colon artist, and then check for whatever. And that will do it. But that is gross looking indeed. But we can wrap up the creation of anonymous function. Wait. Oh! So you can make a function that returns a lambda. So defun artist selector of artist. And that just returns a lambda. And I will I will follow your suggestion, uh, Charlie, in chat to not use the hash quote. So lambda takes a CD and checks if equal b the artist of CD with the actual result of the function. Nice. This is a function that returns a function and one that represent, references a variable name that won't even exist after art of selector returns, but it actually works because the variable will be bound by the time it actually gets run. So if we select using the uh, art of selector function Wait, what, okay. Our selector, um, it will select both of those. And if we want to change that to uh, say Dixie Chicks or something, that will also just work. Nice. Now we just need more functions to generate selectors. But that's boring to generate, to write all these functions, same as we did for the artist, or the select by artist, uh, which we don't need because, oh, I'm not going to look at it yet. Save, save it all. Save all our work here. You can write such a function, but first you need to crash course in a feature called keyword parameters. In the function you've written so far, you've specified a list, a simple list of parameters which are bounded to corresponding arguments in the call of the function. Uh, wraps around list and stuff like that. Sometimes you may want to write a function that can be called with varying numbers of arguments. Keyword parameters are one way to achieve this. Uh, so as like a wrapper around a list, you could use defun foo with the and key, a, b, c, uh, and then all it does is just list A, B, and C. 
And if we call foo with colon a1, colon b2, colon c3, it'll just return one, two, three, but now the arguments are named, I guess. Yeah. Uh, same thing, however, if we happen to decide we want to put them out of order, that is also totally fine, and it will still return them in order because now all of the keys are are determined not by their position after the function name, but by the names themselves, which is the same as like p list function arguments. That's cool. I don't know if Emacs Lisp quite does that. I think I've tried to get it to do that before and it wouldn't. So I just assumed it wasn't possible, but common Lisp just does it. Now also, if again, we wanna do the same kind of thing, but just not specify a parameter, it just be nil. And it will put nil in the place in the list where it goes. And, uh, and if we remove all of the arguments, just call foo, all three arguments will be nil. Uh, whereas if we didn't have the and key, foo would just return a single nil. Actually, no, it wouldn't. No, it would error because of there not being arguments specified properly. To allow this when you specify a keyword. So sometimes you want to know whether that nil uh, came from just not being specified or whether it came from their, uh, from actually passing nil straight through. Uh, so we use a, what's called a supplied P parameter. And it's set to true or false depending on whether an argument was actually passed for that keyword parameter in a particular call to the function. So we can modify this with and key A and then B20 and uh, C30 C dash P. And then we list A, B, C and C dash P. I'm going to make this multiple lines because, wait, yes, multiple lines. Okay. So for foo, so if we want to call foo now with no arguments, A is nil, B has a default value of 20, C has a default of value of 30, and uh, C dash P is set to nil because it was not specified. But if we call foo with a1b2c3, we get 1, 2, 3 for a, b, and c. And c dash p is true because we know that it was included. Okay, that's good. I can't imagine though how it's gonna 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 affect going on that is useful about about argument parameters we're getting into stuff I didn't didn't know yet so that we're gonna make a selector function generator and we're gonna be able to call where on it oh no we're, we're gonna call it where okay Because so so we're gonna make a function called where uh, and it's gonna take four keyword parameters corresponding to the fields in the CD record and generates a selector function that selects any CD that match 
is all of the values given to where. Okay, so it's going to use, use keyword arguments. I'm not quite... I'm trying not to read ahead and look at the function, but I know I'm going to have to. So you could like select where artist is Dixie Chicks, or select where the rating is 10 and it's not ripped. That would be nice indeed. Uh, so then we just make a little bit of a, an and expression. So def and where and the arguments are going to be key arguments with the title, artist, rating, and ripped, nil, ripped, p. I don't understand why we need to specify different stuff for ripped yet. And then it's going to return a lambda, which we're not hash quoting because, because, and the lambda takes a CD, and it just checks all of the all of the stuff. Uh, so if the title, if there's a title, we're going to check if the uh, title is the same as the title. And return true in that case if there is an artist specified uh, we're just going to do the same thing equal the get f the value of artist in and return true if so okay I'm gonna shrink this a bit so we can see better yeah and the same thing for rating, rating, yes. I don't like some of this doubled up code. There should probably a macro or something you could do to make that easier. But we'll get to it later, probably, maybe. I'm not sure how long you keep streaming. I want to get to a stopping point. True. And then ripped P is a little, oh, it's not a bit different. CD whether it's ripped. True. Oh, ripped. And then true. Wait, so if it's ripped P, we get the. We check if the value is true, but if it's not ripped, then we just don't bother and just return true because this is an and function and everything has to be true uh, if it's true it prints it out and if it's a nil uh, the function is just all nil so this function returns an anonymous function that returns the logical and of one clause per field in our CD records, each clause checks if the appropriate argument was passed in and then either compares it to the value in the corresponding field in the CD record or returns true if the parameter was not passed in. So the selector function will return true only for CDs that match all of the arguments passed to, passed to where here, which is our function. You need to have the three item list to specify the ripped parameter because you need to know whether the caller actually passed ripped nil meaning uh, to select oh that's why they went on the tangent about nil versus unspecified because because otherwise whether or not it would be ripped would be the same question as whether or not you care if it's ripped, which is obviously not quite correct. So that that's a little workaround for that. That's nice. 
like it. And they formatted this a little bit differently. They put extra spaces in there. That's nice, but we don't really need that, I don't think. So let's review what what it what did it want us to use with where for lost I. So we want to select where the artist is Green Day. Does that work? That works! Okay. Okay, we're we're getting somewhere. It shows it shows the results. But there's another use for where now, isn't there? Now you've got a nice generalized select and where functions. Good position to write the next feature that every database needs. A way to update particular records. In Squirrel, the update command is used to update a set of records matching a particular where clause. That seems like a good model, especially since you've already got a where clause generator. In fact, the update function is mostly just the application of a few ideas you've already seen. Using a passed in selector function, choose the records to update, and using keyword arguments to specify the values to change. Okay, I am I am not tired. I've been drinking Mountain Dew all day. How am I tired? <laughs> okay. Must be talking too much or something. Also it's raining pretty hard out kind of snowing a little bit so that could also be doing it so right so what we want to do is we're updating and what that means is like changing out the value of a key inside of the database the main new bit is the use of map car that maps over a list Ooh, i like map car uh, which is db in this case and returns a new list containing the results of calling a function on each item in the original list. Yeah, so map car it, it builds another it builds a new list. So we're going to create this update function. If an update selector function as our main value and it's going to have a bunch of keys, title, an artist, and rating, and ripped, nil, ripped. You know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to do something real quick. My Emacs is rendering this weirdly, so I'm going to call. The function I wrote, and I can never remember what it's called. Um, let me no. Um, HL column. It's related to that. It's um in it. HL call line in it. That's what it was. Okay. It basically, it draws a crosshairs around the cursor, and it was uh, it does that with overlays, and the overlays were causing the line to turn over, and break up the visuals of it. So we want to avoid that. So we're defining a function update, uh, and it takes all of those parameters. And it's going to modify the DV variable. 
uh, with the result of this map car statement, which is actually, uh, it loops over a function and returns a new function. And the purpose of the, it loops over a list with a function. The first argument of a map car is always the function to run over the list, which in this case is the lambda, which takes one argument of row. When, are we using when? When call selector. Okay, selector function is in this case a variable, which is why we're func calling it. It's gonna be set to the result of like a where type of function. Uh, so we're basically, we're only doing this when it's not nil. Uh, but if it is not nil, if the title is defined, we're going to set f. Wait, set f and get f are like a pair, aren't they? Hang language is different. Hey. Cyan, I see you in chat. I'm, if I if I get if I if I read it too much, I'm gonna not be able to transcribe this though. Give me a second. If artist is defined, we're going to change the value of it in place. Artist, basically what we're doing. Anki, yeah, I've seen Anki. I have it downloaded on my phone, I just haven't bothered getting it all working yet. All right, I've ripped P, set F. Two, three, and then returns the row. Why is it returning the row? I don't know. The second argument is, of course, DB. One, two, three. Hey, I got the right uh, uh, number of parentheses at the end. So set F on a complex form. It's a general assignment operator that can be assigned to places. It can put it puts things in places, other than just variables. Um, but set f and get f just happen to have similar names. They're not actually like mirrors of each other. That's a little bit disappointing, but also nice because set and get is a false dichotomy. There was a really cool. Uh, there's this guy Kevlin Henney. He does talks at like hacking conferences and programming places and stuff and one of his talks is about how uh, there's all of these assumptions we make about language in code that aren't actually that true like you think of getting as like you're, it's a simple query and setting you're just putting a value and that's all you're doing but like that's not what it means in English and that's not really what it's doing in the code either it's just kind of a an abstraction we make for ourselves that doesn't always work. So we've made this update function, and I'm going to just evaluate it quickly. So we want to update. Wait, wait let's uh, select. I want to just check real quick what the uh, where the artist is. Uh, I hear no. I just want to check what I put. I put the rating as seven. I actually want to up that a little bit. I've been listening to the song recently. So I'm going to update that where the artist is Aya Hirano. And I am going to update that to the rating being uh, nine. Boom. 
The rating is now 9 for Hanekana Yukai. Cool. And then we can uh, select that again, look, query just that, and boom, the rating is 9. Also make a function to just delete rows from the database. Let's say defun delete rows selector function set f db remove if we have remove if didn't we already oh that was remove if not okay same kind of deal though Yeah, remove if is just like remove if not, except not. So, select new delete rows where Uh, let's say I'm tired of being associated with this author who cares about the Dixie Chicks. I don't have anything against them, but I don't know who they are, and I don't really want them in my database. I could just delete rows where the artist is Dixie Chicks, and then if we uh, try and select where the artist is Dixie Chicks again, uh, it returns nil. But what about when the artist is uh, Kathy Matea? I don't know who she is either, um, but I know that I uh, probably don't. Okay, hang on. Wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just scrolling back through. I'm going a little wild with this now that I have the power. And boom, now you can actually see the whole thing on the screen. Uh, so we've just got songs that I actually listen to. Hooray. That's, that is actually pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's the kind of problem that you wouldn't think to solve unless you were doing an exercise like this. But like now that you can kind of see how it, how it's, how it's doing. We're actually saving the results back in the database, and that's an implementation deal. Though. So, so far, all the database code for all of this stuff, including the uh, the interface, is just a little over 50 lines. This buffer is 70 lines. There might be a couple things in here that don't need to be here, or that. Uh, they put as one-liners that I didn't because of space and time. But that's, there's a little bit of code duplication here. So we're gonna try and, try and remove that. You can remove the duplication and make the code more flexible at the same time. The duplication I'm thinking of is in the where function. There's our where function. Look at all this. Look at all these multiple lines there. That's not ideal. Also, update has the same thing. <clears throat> For now, it's not so bad, but like if you try to add another one, you'll have to change them all, that kind of thing. Update suffers from the same kind of duplication, exactly. It's doubly annoying since the whole point of the where function is to dynamically generate code, but like we're hard coding all the cases, so what's up with that? Not the best. Imagine you were trying to optimize this code and discovered it was spending too much time checking title um, or checking whether title was even set. If you really wanted to remove all those runtime checks, you could 
go through a program and find all the places where you call where and look at exactly what arguments you're passing. Then replace all of the where's with a lambda that does some stuff. Wait. Oh. But then that's working backwards. Because in, instead of because the whole point of where is that it's easier to use, uh, and just putting an anonymous function there is harder to use, um, but it is maybe faster sometimes. So uh, we don't really want to do that though, because again, where was nice to have. But if there was enough of them, it would be good to try and optimize where if there were enough of them and it was important enough it might even be worthwhile to write some kind of preprocessor that converts where calls to the code you'd write by hand. The Lisp feature that makes this trivially easy is its macro system. I can't emphasize enough that the common Lisp macro shines essentially nothing but the name or shares essentially nothing but the name with the text-based macros found in C and C++ where the C preprocessor stand operates by text textual substitution and understands almost nothing of the structure of C and C++. A Lisp macro is essentially a code generator that gets run for you automatically by the compiler. This is this is the cool stuff. This, this is the good part of Lisp. When a Lisp expression contains a call to a macro Instead of evaluating the arguments and passing them to the function, the Lisp compiler passes the arguments unevaluated to the macro code, which returns a new Lisp expression that is then evaluated in place of the original macro call. There is an advanced book that I've read through a few times uh, called Let Over Lambda. Let me see if I can pull up the site for it. It's there it is, letoverlambda.com. We go to just table of contents there. I am going to put this, I'm just gonna drop a link to this in chat. It's really good. Good personal benchmark is to just go through that book and see how little you understand. There's a couple other things like that. It's like you read it and you're like, this is probably very cool, but I have no idea what it means. And then you come back to it a few months later, like, oh that's what that was! Wait, I read this before. How did I not realize that? Oh, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. Uh, it's just it's just fun to like see, and all of, most all of the stuff in Let Over Lambda there also applies to Elisp. I think most of it. I I tr started to try and like go through, but didn't end up go getting very far. It's like when you started when you start from the front from the beginning, it's hard to see what actually matters. But if you start at the end, you can like work backwards very quickly, I found. So anyway, macros are cool, and we're going to do a silly little macro. Uh, so like def macro, and I want to say Marco here, uh, rip Marco. Uh, spoilers for season one of Attack on Titan, by the way. It's an ancient show, you should have already. Verse expert. So this macro will just take an expression. Wait, what? So this macro, uh, which should probably have a name, come to think of it. <laughs> Backwards. All right, and it gives us the name of it back. Cool, welcome to the stream if you're just joining us. Uh, we're working through Practical Common Lisp at gigamonkeys.com slash book and chapter or something. It's the first practical here. And it's on a tangent explaining what macros are. So macros are, are fun and I'll probably end up calling them Marcos a few times because it's easier for me to say that. So there's this silly little macro uh, backwards. And the main difference when you're defining it is that you use def macro instead of def fun. Um, but it has a different effect. So if we want to backwards, 
can't spell anymore. The list of Hello World. True on format. Uh, that would. Oh my gosh! Wait, that does both things? Okay, okay, okay. So that list, the, the, the parameter that's taken by the macro is it's a list with hello world and true and format. So backwards, as we saw earlier, will reverse the expression. So it returns the list format T hello world. But it actually also, we didn't quote it. So it goes ahead and evaluates it because it passes it through to the REPL at that point. Because So the macro happens beforehand. It happens before the read stage. No, the, so macros are, are executed at the read stage before the eval stage then. But wait, that doesn't... Okay, I'm not sure quite what that means, but it's... Isn't that cool, though, how it just... It changed it and then it executed it in, like, the same stroke. Okay. Okay. Backwards macros defines a new language that's a lot like Lisp, just backwards. Uh, cue that, that meme that PewDiePie is... It's evolving, just, just, just backwards. I don't, I don't remember. Uh... Yeah. And a compiled Lisp program, that new language is just as efficient as normal Lisp because all the macro code runs at compile time. In other words, the compiler will generate exactly the same code whether you write backwards hello world format true or whether you write this or just the format true hello world like we did at the very beginning. So how does that help with the code duplication in where? Remember this, this where function we got that takes, takes too much, uh, that has too much, takes up too much space. It's got so much code duplication. You can write a macro that generates the exact same code for each particular call to where the best approach, again, is to build our code bottom up. In the hand optimized selector function, what you would do is you'd have uh, an equal get FCD field value. Okay. I need to slow down again because it's getting to the point where I'm just breezing through instead of understanding. How do, how do my viewers feel? Do you guys want to keep going or, uh, or should I quit at this point and then just come back in a bit because I wanted to get to like a stopping point but this okay we are most of the way down the page just that much farther I guess um, I don't know I'm gonna try and keep going for now maybe may as well Okay, so we want to make a function. We want to make a macro that will turn, that will return each of these lines in the function, right? Wait. Let's learn a function. Wait. Okay, I'm lost. I'm so lost. My my brain's RAM is completely full. Me and she involved. Need to 
wieder mit Harry Marcel. Okay. I was trying to like interpret ahead of this and the the, uh, the words were confusing me. So we could try to like make we could just try try to find a function make comparison expr field that takes a field and a value and returns a list um, with equal and a list of get f and cd and field value. However, apparently that's not going to work because it says wrong here. Uh, and the problem is that all of these things are variable names are going to get interpreted as variable names in this case. Which is fine for field and value because those are like in the function, but get f and cd and equal. Equal we want to be a function and get f we want to be a function and cd we want to be a, vari an, a variable that's a different level. Uh, so that's not quite going to work. But there's also quotes, so we can uh, prevent those variables from getting evaluated by sticking quotes in front of them. So list equal, now let's get f, get cd, field value, okay. So let's evaluate that and make comparison expr with uh, rating. And it will return its function equal get fcd colon rating 10. Nice. Yeah, we can also do that for something with, that's longer but functionally the same. For example, with the title of give us a break. Yeah, do give us a break, man. I'm my, my brain is melting. But there is also a uh, there is a better way to do it apparently. What you really like is a way to write an expression that's mostly not evaluated and then have some way to pick out a few expressions that you do want evaluated. Oh, I know this one. This is cool. Okay. And of course, there is just such a mechanism and it looks like a back quote and that's also what it's called. So, uh, a back quote works just like a quote. Okay, one, two, three. Boom, same as one, two, three. However, if you have nested lists and you uh, use a back quote, that is also still the same as just a normal quote. However, if you put a comma, it will actually evaluate the part after the comma, but not the part outside of the comma. Which means that you can return a list where only some parts are evaluated, which is very, very cool. So uh, instead of having a list of there we can remove that quote and remove that quote and just put a comma there and also value we want to get evaluated so comma there nice nice i like that that just about makes sense with what we know about macros which is still a little bit confusing but it's fine
Now all those were wrapped in, in ands. Assume for a moment that you'll arrange for the arguments for the where macro to be passed as a single list. You'll need a function that can take the elements of such a list pairwise and collect the results of calling make comparison expert on each pair. Implement that function. You can okay. Hang on. Hang on. I don't get it yet. You know what? I'll be right back. Just a second. I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay, we still got a viewer. Whew, just worried there for a second. Um, okay, where are we? Make comparison expert, which we want to return a field that's kind of like these guys. These guys. Yeah, it's showing up. And it wraps those in a list. So, we can use loop to do that. So, I'll define make comparison list. Uh, it takes a bunch of fields. That is how you spell fields. I know how to spell fields. The I before E is definitely not confusing to me ever at all. No, no, no. I'm a prodigy. Loop uh, while fields. And I guess that's just going to go over all of them. Loop while fields collecting. So loop actually does like several different things that are kind of vaguely related. Um, it's actually insane how many things loop does and I have never seen the while collecting construct with loop because uh, I haven't played around with loop very much but we're just gonna go with it for now uh, it says that they're just gonna talk about it in chapter 22 because it's such a big deal and we're in like chapter 3 I've been streaming for two hours and 40 minutes oh dear so collecting uh, make comparison expert pop fields pop fields wait does the popping do different stuff different times like it changes the actual value of field itself Oh, it does, it does, it does. That may, okay, okay. So basically, this make comparison list function, it results in a whole bunch of 
it you you give it a list and each of those wait the person in this field yes you give it a list of fields and it's going to loop through each of those fields and in pairs it's going to make comparison experts because it's because the comparison expert takes two two values it takes a field and a value and so the fields that you're passing to make comparison list are formatted as as a plist so each pair is going to get passed to make comparison expert like you would okay that just clicked for me it might not have clicked for you uh don't worry about it i hate to say that i don't know how better to describe it if i try to i might i might lose it i might unclick okay full discussion of loop we'll have to wait until chapter 22 but it just for now know that it does what you want it to do it loops when there are elements left in fields um, and inside of the loop it pops off two elements at a time in pairs which it passes to make comparison expert now you just need to wrap up the list returned by make comparison list and an and and a, and a lambda which can be done inside of where itself so let's uh, let's make where a macro then so def macro where and rest clauses so we're going to it's it back quotes a hash quote lambda but I'm pretty sure we don't need a hash quote so wait can we just back quote a lambda I'm gonna try just back quoting a lambda you can't stop me lambda of the CD right because because that's because we're, we're returning an anonymous function and comma at which is a splice make comparisons list clauses there we go okay this macro uses a variant of comma with the with the and which splices it in uh, to the enclosing list. In a way, if you're familiar with backquote and elisp, it is literally exactly the same as far as I can tell. Okay, cool. So. An important feature of the where Mac hero is the use of and rest, which I'm familiar with from Elisp, but let's see, let's see what they have to say about it. Like in key, and rest modifies the way the rest of the arguments are parsed. With an and rest parameter, with an and rest in its parameter list, a function or macro can take an arbitrary number of arguments, which are collected into a single list that becomes the value of the variable whose name follows the and rest. So um let's see what it says about where it says it's a macro it says it's a function which is a macro i'm not sure whether that's right uh let's just do it deal with it so where title is give us a break which please do and ripped is true what make comparisons list uh, is seems to be broken so we'll evaluate that what hmm. 
make comparison. Oh. I'm a typoer. I make typos. We want make comparison list, not make comparisons list. So we're just gonna save that and reevaluate. And there it goes. And it returns a function which is a lambda taking a CD and wait. Wait, that's it? Sure surely, um is um, about that yeah that's okay I thought it I thought it was like broken because it wasn't giving us anything but I think it's fine pretty pretty sure that's fine all right uh, we're getting close to the end of this page and probably the end of the stream I uh, I just do want to get to a stopping point before I wrap up You can see where it would have called to where we'll generate using macro expand one. If you pass micro expand one, the macro call, like so, macro expand dash one space, and then that, it will show the lambda that is, it'll show the result of the where which is a lambda taking a CD and uh, anding the, the parts of it there, which is similar to what our old where function was doing before, but only including the parts that we actually asked for. See that? This is the same, yeah. Cool. So now we can uh, do a select. I'm just going to uh, try and find an old. We can select where the title and artist is such, and it will return just like it did before. That's awesome. That is cool. And the where macro with its two helper functions. It's actually one line shorter than the old where function. I don't buy that because of uh, indentation. I, when I try to blow it up to the screen to look bigger, it takes up more space. But that's fine. And it's no longer tied to specific records, or specific fields in the record. So if you wanted to add like a, another keyword there, if you wanted to add like a colon. Uh, colon file name or something if you wanted to to advance to the digital age where we can store things on computers uh, it would be able to just accommodate that and you could ask for the file name I'm not going to do that right now but you could now an interesting thing has happened you removed duplication and made the code more efficient and more general at the same time that's often the way it goes with a well chosen macro this makes sense, because a macro is just another mechanism for creating abstractions. Abstractions at the syntactic level, and abstractions are by definition more concise ways of expressing underlying generalities. Okay. I read that in kind of an overly saccharine voice, but it is genuinely cool. Now, the only code in the mini database that's specific to CDs and the fields in them is make CD, prompt for CD, Right, yeah, make for CD, prompt for CD, and add CDs. In fact, our new where macro would work with any plist based database. See, there we go. That's what I told you earlier. However, this is far, still far from being a complete database. You can probably think of plenty of features to add, such as supporting multiple tables or more elaborate queries. In chapter set 27, we'll build an MP3 database that incorporates some of those features. The point of this chapter was to give you a quick introduction to just a handful of Lisp's features and show how they're used to write code that's a bit more interesting than just Hello World. 
In the next chapter, we'll begin a more systematic overview of Lisp. And uh, that seems like a pretty good time to end it. Now there is a whole bunch of footnotes, but I... <laughs> this, this footnote is hilarious. A friend of mine was once interviewing an engineer for programming job and asked him a typical interview question. How do you know when a function or method is too big? Well, said the candidate, I don't like any method to be bigger than my head. You mean you can't keep all the details in your head? No, I mean I put my head up against the monitor and the code shouldn't be bigger than my head. <laughs> That's good. That's that's really good, honestly. That's that's great. Okay, and that's basically the uh There's this thing, there's, there's some other fun footnotes, doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, that was our first practical. We are three chapters into practical common lisp. And I, I got to admit, this book was a bit longer than I was expecting, but it's all good. Could have been way longer. We're just going to uh, try and go through for a whole bunch of... Uh, a bunch of other stuff and it's gonna be good but for now I think I'm gonna call it a day so thank you everybody for watching all, all one of you and uh, or all, all four of you it says I've got four views all five of you because one of those probably didn't get counted and uh, I'm gonna probably do this at a different time next time I'm not sure when probably like either the day after tomorrow, which is Friday, or maybe next week. We'll see. But for now, uh, that's that's going to be it for me. And, uh, and I'm out. Hit the wrong button. Sorry, bye.